All right. Good evening, everyone, and really um, welcome. I am Maura Spiegel, and I will be your host this evening at Narrative Medicine Rounds. On behalf of the Division of Narrative Medicine at Columbia University Irving Medical Center, I welcome those of you who are joining Rounds for the first time, and welcome back all the returning attendees. Narrative Medicine arose at Columbia in 2001, and it is now an international movement at the intersection of humanities, the arts, clinical practice, and healthcare justice. Narrative training equips clinicians to humbly try to comprehend their patients' experiences and perspectives so as to deliver equitable and effective healthcare. Rigorous training and practice of narrative medicine helps all those interested in person centered, respectful healthcare to deepen their self awareness, clinical attunement, collaborative skills, and creative capacities. Our commitments to healthcare justice underlie our writing, teaching, research, advocacy, and delivery of care. The narrative medicine community assembles monthly at rounds to grow our knowledge, partnership, and commitment to a just and effective healthcare. So, um, we introduce our speaker for tonight. I've been asked to mention a few basic Zoom ground rules to ensure the program goes smoothly. Please keep your microphone muted to cut down on background noise during the program. Be forewarned that if there are any disruptions or inappropriate comments in the chat, you may be removed from the event. Seems unlikely. During the talk, we ask people to keep chat interactions to a minimum. As we get closer to the Q&A part of the, of the evening, we will invite you to submit questions via the chat for a speaker. But before then, we won't be monitoring questions. So please save your questions to type into the chat after we make that announcement. The event is being recorded. Everyone who registered will get the link to it a day or two after the event, and you can share it as you wish. Captioning will be available during tonight's event. At the end, we'll have a link to the online bookstores to order books or find more information about our speaker and about the Department of Medical Humanities and Ethics and the program in there. So now it is my great, great pleasure to introduce Vivian Heller reading from her new book, Exile and Analysis, Boyhood, Loss, and the Lessons of Anna Freud, a book that's been described as little short of a miracle. Vivian Heller received her PhD in English Literature and Modern Studies from Yale University. Her first book on James Joyce entitled Joyce, Decadence and Emancipation won the Choice Book Award. This was followed by a remarkable history of the building of the New York subway, the city beneath us. More recently, she has published essays and short stories in the Georgetown Review, Confrontation, Bomb, Fence, and Elsewhere. She has taught at Bennington, Barnard, and Bard Colleges, and is currently a lecturer in, the, in Columbia's program in narrative medicine. As you will hear, Vivian's writing is scorchingly lucid. In her fiction, she achieves the authority to render the deep past in the daily life of a medieval mystic or the inner world of a feral child. And now we will travel to pre-war Vienna. Welcome my dear friend and colleague, Vivian Heller. Thank you, Maura. Thanks for that beautiful introduction. And thank you to the Narrative Medicine Program for inviting me to speak. And to all of you who are attending tonight um, and a special thanks to my family. In narrative medicine, we talk about the importance of listening attentively and compassionately to one another's stories. But what happens when a child tells his story to an adult and that adult, after listening very carefully and very compassionately, sets out to teach that child what his story really means? This is a question that informs some of the passages I'll read to you tonight. But first, a few, I'd like to say a few words about my sources. When my father was in his 60s and I was in my 30s, he reluctantly gave me one of his books. I had been pressing him to give it to me. When he finally did, he said, you really might not want to read it, and that's quite all right. This note of apology mixed with warning went right into me. I didn't read the book closely until long after he had died. When I did, it opened an entire world to me. 
The title of that book was A Child Analysis with Anna Freud. It consisted of my father's case history as recorded by Anna Freud from when he was nine to 12 years old, as well as the reflections, reminiscences, critiques, and questions that he had added half a year late, half, I'm sorry, half a century later. How did he come by his case history? Anna Freud had sent him a folder of the poems and stories he had given her as a child, adding, I also have your case history. Would you like me to have it sent to you upon my death? Or would you like it to be destroyed? My father said that he wanted her to send him his case history right away. And after a long back and forth, she finally agreed, even though she had never done anything like this before. This book and the internment diary that my father wrote as a young man were the primary sources for my book. I'd like to begin my reading with the fateful dream that brought my father to Anna Freud. For those of you who have the book, um, this would be pages three and four. When my father was a little boy in Vienna, he told Anna Freud this dream. He is walking on the rim of the white gravel path that leads around the oval pond in the upper part of the Belvedere Gardens. The birds are singing, the sun is out, his hands are in his pockets, he's whistling to himself. Suddenly he becomes aware of a distant rumbling that seems to be coming from the lower part of the garden. He looks down the path and doesn't see anything at first. Then a blue-black machine with a brilliant array of handles and shafts comes into sight. It is flattening the gravel, making it level and smooth. The machine is heading straight towards him. He tries to get up off the path onto the soft green grass, but even though it's only a matter of a few inches, he can't lift his feet. The machine comes closer and closer, finally catching him up and pressing him with its huge rods and shafts. He calls out for help as loud as he can, but no one comes to rescue him. There is nothing he can do. The machine grinds him up. Night after night, this dream kept coming back so that he was afraid to fall asleep. But sleep always caught up with him in the end, no matter how hard he tried to resist. Sometimes he woke up in the kitchen, face down on the stone floor. Other times he woke up in a bath of ice cold water. He knew that he had been screaming because his voice was hoarse. Sometimes there were bruises on his arms and legs. Anna Freud told my father that she knew something about dreams and that by putting their heads together, they could probably make his dream go away. And so a conversation began that lasted for the next four years and that played itself back to him for the rest of his life. So it soon became clear that a key element in my father's case was the breakup of his parents' marriage. His mother, Margareta Steiner, had abandoned my father when he was four years old. She was brilliant, artistic, charismatic, unhappy in her marriage, and determined to pursue a career in film. His father, Hans Heller, a wealthy candy manufacturer, had agreed on a separation provided that Peter would remain with him. Margareta, also known as, as Mem, agreed, knowing that in her new life, she wouldn't have the means to provide for her son. However, she often came to visit him, and these visits were the occasion of excitement, joy, and tremendous disappointment when she went away again. Anna Freud became one of several mother figures in his life, of all of them, she was far and away the most powerful. The next passage I'd like to read describes my father's sessions with Anna Freud. It's on pages nine through 12. While his mother struggled to find her way, Peter had his sessions with Anna Freud, which followed the same pattern every day. The chauffeur would pick him up from the evangelical elementary school, in his father's Italian sports car and drop him off at 19 Bergkasse. Walking up the worn marble steps to the second floor, he would run his hand from knob to knob of the iron railing, counting to himself. 
When he finally got to the door, he peered through the little glass spy hole, trying to see if the doorkeeper was peering back at him. In the waiting area, he kept his eyes on Sigmund Freud's door, and now and then he caught a glimpse of him, thin and bent, with a balding head and a gray beard, sitting at an enormous desk crowded with ancient figurines. Everyone said that Sigmund Freud was a very great man, but when Peter actually crossed paths with him, he would simply say, in a faint, mumbling voice, as though he had a piece of unchewed food in his mouth, Is this really the Heller boy? My, how you've grown! Exactly as any other grown-up would. In, Anna, in Anna's office, there weren't any figurines, only a portrait of Sigmund Freud that followed Peter with its eyes. The portrait couldn't see him when he lay down on the couch, which made up for the fact that he couldn't see Anna, even though he was often tempted to twist it around and check whether she was really listening to him. Since he wasn't allowed to look at her, he looked instead at Wolfie, a coal black German shepherd with sharp yellow teeth that lay on a tattered rug with his head between his paws. He was afraid of Wolfie the first few times, but after that he mainly felt sorry for him, trapped indoors all day without any hope of going outside. Sometimes just the clicking of Anna's needles made Peter want to jump off the couch, run around the room, and knock her lace-covered tables down. If only Wolfie would leap up and bark like mad. He knew just how to get him to do it, but it wasn't allowed. As time went on, Peter learned ways of distracting himself without Anna noticing. If he squinted, for example, he could make out the titles of her books, even though the glass-covered bookshelf was halfway across the room. Once she let him take down a book and leaf through it, even though, strictly speaking, it was against her rules. It was by the philosopher Nietzsche. She had his complete works, which took up two entire shelves. I want to be a great writer, he told her. My father says that a great writer must have read everything. He rattled off the titles of some of the books that Hans had read to him, hoping that she would notice how advanced they were. No answer, just the snoring of Wolfie on his rug and the clicking of her knitting needles. Was she even listening? He was nothing to her, just another one of her customers. Why had he ever thought that she was beautiful with her drab clothes and her hair pulled back in a bun? She was only really interested in hearing about shameful things, things that normal people, like his nursemaid, Taisy, considered piggish and disgusting, like his habit of spying on men in the public toilet. He didn't know why he had to come here every day. Wasn't it just a waste of time? She didn't even think it was that important to be great. She said it was more important to develop into a real human being, whatever that meant. How could a grown person not care about being great? Didn't it bother her that she was going to die? Her own father had written that there was no such thing as God, which meant that when you died, you just evaporated into space and your atoms scattered across the universe. The only way not to disappear was to be great, like Goethe or Shakespeare or Karl May, who had written at least 100 adventure books. If you couldn't be immortal like Zeus, at least you could be immortal in words, like the creator of Faust or the author of Winnetou. Sometimes he hated the sound of her voice, so reasonable and steady and matter-of-fact. Other times he wondered what would happen if he broke all of her rules, fell down on his knees, and hugged her legs. She told him to draw pictures of, her, of his dreams, even though drawing really wasn't what he did the best. She liked looking at his drawings, no matter how sloppy they were, and would say to him, and would ask him what every squiggle meant. He made his drawings more and more elaborate, so that he could stretch out the time of sitting right next to her on the couch. She didn't use perfume, the way his mother did, but she smelled nice anyway. Still, he wished that she would pay attention to his drawing, to, that she would pay less attention to his drawings and more attention to his stories, because, as his father said, a writer needs an audience. She didn't want to use she didn't want to use all their time hearing him read his stories out loud. She said that it was more useful for him to lie on the couch and say whatever came into his head. He could still tell her his stories, but they came out sounding more like dreams, and he often forgot important details when he was telling them to her, 
only remembering them later when the driver was speeding him back home. Finally, she told him that if he brought his stories to her, she would read them in the evening when her sessions were done. He pictured her sitting in her red velvet armchair late at night with Wolfie lying at her feet and his pages in her hands. He gave her a 10-page novella that he had finished before he started coming to her, all about a factory owner who starts out wanting to kill himself and ends up deciding to stay alive after he starts a revolution in the factory. She liked the story so much that she typed it up for him, and she typed up all his stories after that, keeping them in a special drawer along with her own papers so that they wouldn't get lost. In a way, Anna was like a mother to him, or maybe a cross between a mother and a scientist. She never hugged him or kissed him the way his mother did, and she wouldn't let him hug or kiss her, although it was all right for him to talk about wanting to. But she knew things about him that not even Mem knew, things that he had never planned on telling anyone, like what happened to his body when he got excited, or the fact that he sometimes wet his bed. What I discovered is that Anna's office was not only a place of therapy, it was also a place of education. She was a mother, analyst, and educator all in one. In the following passage, my father learns that his parents are going to get an official divorce and that his mother will never live with him again. And he learns something additionally bewildering from Anna Freud. So this would be on pages 15 and 16 of the book. One evening, in the midst of reading to him, Hans broke off. There's something I need to explain to you, he said in a serious voice. Why can't we go on reading, Peter said, reaching for the book. Your mother and I will always be good friends, Hans went on, holding the book away from him. But you should stop waiting for her to move back in with us. Peter turned his face to the wall, tracing the pattern of leaves on his wallpaper until he reached the stain that looked like a panther with scraggly fur. Hans didn't say anything more. All Peter could hear was the ticking of his cuckoo clock. When he turned back to Hans, he seemed small, as though he was looking at him through the wrong end of a telescope. He wished that Hans would put his glasses back on. His eyes reminded him of soft-boiled eggs, and he hated the embroidered handkerchief that his father was wiping his glasses with. He hated the big HH and the little Heller crown, the mark of a tradition he would have to carry on. Why did you have to stop reading, he complained, pulling his blanket over his head. A few days later, Anna told him all about eggs and sperms and what a man's penis was for and what husbands and wives did together when they were ready to have a child. I'm sure that Mem and Hans never did anything like that, Peter said. How do you think it happened, she asked him. In a doctor's office, he shrugged, with the doctor telling them what to do. It was hard to lie still after that, so he drew instead, covering several pieces of paper with lopsided circles and squiggly lines. Do you wish I hadn't told you? she asked when the hour was finally over. No, he said, jumping off the couch in relief. It was quite worthwhile. On the way home, he stared out the windows of the car, looking at the couples walking along the Ringstrasse, some hand in hand, others arm in arm, others walking a few feet apart. Could it really be true? He shook his head. He was never going to get married, that was for sure. He couldn't believe that Mem, who was always so elegant and clean, would do something as dirty and disgusting as that. Anna Freud's role as educator was deepened by my father's attendance to the Hitzing School, the experiment in education undertaken by Anna Freud. Ava Rosenfeld and Dorothy Burlingham. The Hitzing School was progressive, project-oriented, and psychologically enlightened. It also constituted a sheltered, idealistic world, one in which anti-Semitism had no real place. Here and, here and in his therapy, my father was led into a way of seeing things that was rational, utopian, and enlightened. But even as a child, his tendency was to aggressively question everything, which emerges in the passage I'd like to read next 
Um, this passage is on, it's on pages 67 and 68. Is there, is there such a thing as Vartoime, dreams of prophecy? Peter asks Tezi one day. He already knows better than to ask Anna. Tezi, who will one day become a respected analyst in her own right, tells him without hesitation, no, there are no Vartoime. This teaching goes along with the principle that every emotion can be translated into a thought. Reason can illuminate and disentangle the maze of the past. Imagination without reason can't tell us what we will become. There are no Vartoime. This is not only an assertion of rationality, but an assertion of faith. And yet how fragile this inward-seeking faith will seem in just a few more years. Peter reads Craven's The Death Ship, a picaresque novel about an American sailor who spends a night with a prostitute and misses his ship. Without identity papers, he becomes an unwanted alien and is kicked from one port to another. In the midst of reading this book, he has a nightmare that he is drowning and runs screaming to Tazy's bed. Anna notes, he doesn't want to admit that he has screamed, says it was because of the fever. To explain his exclamation while sick, he read the novel The Ship of the Dead by B. Traven that deals with the destiny of stateless people who have no passport and are shipped from one country to another. At the end of this note, Anna sums up her thoughts. Stateless, parentless equals Peter. But why would a little boy be interested in a book about what it means to be stateless? The question is not important to Anna Freud. What is key is that he feels parentless. Immediacy borrows its intensity from what it draws up. The family romance is primary. And so Anna continues to write her notes. Meanwhile, it's 1931 and the clock is ticking. As a 60 year old man trying to feel his way back into his own past with the aid of those notes, Peter will regret the fact that he was told that there was no such thing as a prophetic dream. He will wonder how he would have developed if he hadn't grown up in such a skeptical world. He will regret the fact that so little real authority was granted to the synthetic power of poetic imagination and so much emphasis was placed on analysis. He will think there was something admirable about his mother's commitment to telling stories and realizing herself as an artist, despite all the pain she caused him. And he will point out with stubborn insistence that not everything that Anna said was true. When he and his cousin were fleeing Austria, for example, they had to show the books they were carrying, and his cousin happened to be carrying Traven's The Death Ship. The guard questioned his cousin about the book and Peter talked back, with the result that they had to clean out the train station bathrooms on their hands and knees. He never forgot this moment at the border, which could easily have cost them their lives. Perhaps his childhood dream, triggered by reading the Traven book, had contained some seeds of prophecy after all. Perhaps there really were some other ways of reading dreams and reading reality, but during his formative childhood years, those ways had been closed off to him. I'd now like to leap ahead to 1940. My father has fled Vienna and has just started to create a meaningful life for himself in Cambridge. England, only to be arrested as a foreign national and to be held in various camps ultimately winding up as an internee in Canada. He is thrown in not only with other Jewish refugees, but also with Nazi POWs. It seems important to mention here that in every camp he ends up in, there are several, and there are several, um, the Jewish refugees immediately set up classes trying to hold on to culture, onto civilization. The following passage takes place in Bury St. Edmunds, England, and it includes Victor Rosenfeld, who is the son of one of the three founders of the Hitzing School, friend of his childhood and companion in internment. We now see Peter in a new position. He is now the note taker, trying to make sense of a world that is fragmented and irrational. 
So in the book, this would be pages 168 and 169. Between hunger and classes and more hunger and endless debate, there are moments of reprieve. When it isn't raining, they are taken out to a field that lies between their barracks and the street. Although the field is overgrown with nettles and weeds, there are patches of soft grass here and there. While the guards look on in their stiff uniforms, the internees unbutton their shirts and bathe in the sun. One afternoon, he and Vicky wrestle in the field, exactly as they did when they were boys. Afterwards, they lie on their backs and stare up at the racing clouds. Do you ever think of Vienna, Peter asks, rolling onto his stomach and picking apart a dandelion? I try my best not to, Vicky replies. But it's our city. Not anymore. Peter turns his head and gazes at the street, littered with bits of paper and orange peel. Children are playing on another street. He can hear their shouts off in the distance. Three girls pass by giggling at the sight of so many young men, and they are immediately greeted with a flurry of whistles and calls. For once, the guards don't intervene, looking on impassively. Discussions are their main way of passing the time, but many of their discussions explode into, into fights. A short Polish Jew, very thin with a pockmarked face, loves to argue with a fanatical, bitterly humorous Jew who holds that rational thought is valuable, not because it's right, but because it's a means of prevailing over circumstance. They play out the same battle over and over again, never growing tired of it. A rabbi says to a socialist, one day the Messiah will come and everyone will stand up in their graves. How can anyone in their right mind still believe something like that? The socialist replies, shaking his head. So many problems are taken up. Peter goes around the hall with his journal in his hand, jotting down the various topics that are being discussed. Anti-Semitism, freedom of will, rights of inheritance, sine 2 minus cosine 2y. But the question that haunts all of them, even in their sleep, is the question of what will happen to them if Germany succeeds in conquering England. He is hungry, very hungry, for most of the day, and comforts himself by thinking of Indianer Klepfen, Viennese sponge cake topped with chocolate and filled with whipped cream, Zachertort, lobsters with mayonnaise. The food here is very bad, stingy portions of bread, watery, unsweetened tea, a bit of canned fish or boiled cabbage here and there. Writing allows him to forget his hunger for a little while, but he never forgets that he is surrounded by barbed wire. How wonderful it would be to walk freely through the streets, he writes, if there were no Hitler, and if it weren't for these horrible machines that I used to dream of when I was a boy. Yes, the machine is coming up behind us, and if we walk along the manicured paths of the park, and whistle carelessly to ourselves, it is suddenly upon us, snatching us up and pressing us up against its metal bars until there is nothing left of us. Thank you very much for listening. And now I'd like to turn things over to Maura. Okay. Um, I want to take us back a little bit to the childhood. Um, one of the sequences I was so charmed by was your account of the effect on Peter of his first American children, the mm. Burlinghams, whose mother Dorothy, who was the Tiffany heiress, um, helped fund the school that Anna Freud and Ava Rosenfeld uh, established together. Here's a bit of your description, if I can read it back to you. Mm. The Burlinghams move into the apartment above Freud's on the Burgasse, and the school is invited to a reception there. Bob, that's the eldest child, treats the little ones to an American delicacy, cornflakes, sugar, mm. and milk. Tinky, one of the children, is wearing a white blouse, um, a red, red and blue plaid skirt, and an Indian headdress with white and orange feathers. How fantastically smashing she is. Peter wants desperately to be part of the Burlingham household. Everything about the Burlinghams is magical, and he wants that magic to rub off on him. If he lived here, he could see Tinky whenever he liked. No one could say he was running after her. All he cares about is Tinky with her bobbed straw colored hair, her upturned nose and her mischievous smile. Um, 
And um, he, he goes on, he says, I, um, he has never met anyone like her before. She seems to have floated straight out of a fairy tale. She likes nothing better than to make fun of him so that when he is around her, his feelings are often hurt. But when he reads his stories and poems to her, she listens to every word. Uh, later, Peri um, Peter would write, I admired, much later he would write, looking back, I admired, worshipped, and loved the fair, fine, sensitive, attractive patrician children in their effortless grace, their American sense of humanity, even in their lack of zest and commitment. And I wondered if you could say a little bit, Didi, about, um, about how the presence of this American family and his enormous idealization of them extended the influence on him of Anna Freud and and maybe perhaps a little bit about what happened to that romantic view of Americans once he began living in America. Yeah, okay. Well, I mean, it extended her influence in the sense that the Burlingham family really meshed Dorothy Burlingham and, and Anna Freud became very, very close friends. Um, and Dorothy Burlingham, who had come to Vienna in order to seek care for herself and her son, um, her oldest son especially, um, ended up really becoming a Freudian herself. Um, and so the relationship between Dorothy and Anna was, I mean, they were, it was a very, very intense, very complete kind of relationship. Um, and of course, then the children also there was just a family, the, the closeness of these affiliations created a kind of extended family that was very, very intense. And my father um, kind of entered into it in various stages, um, culminating in the end in his actually marrying Tinky, that was his first wife. Um, but also there was a way in which all of these children were being analyzed by Dorothy Burlingham, by Anna Freud, being observed in the school. So it's just, it's hard to imagine how, how intensely over interwoven everyone was, you know. Um, in terms of his visions of Americans, that's a, <laughs> that's a big question. I mean, I wouldn't, um, he definitely never felt himself that that he he never felt that he became an American. That's for sure. Um, I think he ended up feeling as though he was kind of a stranger wherever he went. Um, but I think that he did. I think that he retained some of that admiration, but also, um, you know, things were also difficult when he came to when he when he came out of internment. He went initially to Canada. Uh, he stayed in Canada and, and studied at McGill, but then he went to Columbia. Um, and at Columbia, he definitely he had a whole milieu. Um, many other refugees were there, um, but he also he also had to struggle. I mean, as a you know as a as a Jewish academic in New York, there was a lot of struggle too and difficulty. So. I think his that idyllic sense of the Americans changed. It even changed in internment too, because because internment made him conscious. Suddenly, he was behind barbed wire, um, and Tinky, for example, and the Burlinghams weren't weren't undergoing anything like that, you know. Um, so, yeah, everything everything shifted. Everything became more complicated. Right. In, in this passage and in many others, you, you employ the, the novelist's technique of free and direct discourse, right? Um, we're, we're really with him and his thoughts in the third person, right? Um, can you say something about your choice to write this history in this novelistic fashion? Well, I think that it, in a way, what I really, what I really wanted to do was to, re, to write in a way that made it clear that this was a reimagining of the past, um, that I was that it was really an attempt to re-enter into something and to bring it to life again, but but that of course would involve my own um, entering into it also. I didn't. It seemed like a truer way to write about it um, than any other way that I could think of. So, 
and it also it also was a way of writing that did enable me to come closer um to come closer to a time that i hadn't myself lived in so so it seemed it felt more genuine to write in that way um and i think also the reason that the the present i wrote a large part of the book is written in the present tense too um and i think that was also part of wanting to to sort of create a sense of intimacy and immediacy um and sub and a kind of subjective perceiving of the world although the sub the subject being my father yeah. his consciousness yeah we we feel so close to him um your depiction of the short-lived Hitzing school um where young eric erickson was among the teachers um fascinates me too and you describe their deep dive into eskimo culture <laughs> building <laughs> igloos out of clay and Umiaks and kayaks and um, and um, testing them on the stream at the edge of the garden. Uh, you write, why do we have to learn about Eskimos? One student asked, because they have a lot to teach us, Eric Erickson replies. But there can be no Eskimos in Europe and other protests. And Peter presses the point, what exactly can we learn from them? <laughs> um, Erickson responds, how to survive. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about this progressive, almost, I guess, utopian world of the school? And I have this image, which I would love to show. Yeah, the school was, um, it was actually that structure in that pic in the picture is a structure that was built just for the school, but it was built in the, basically in the garden of Eva Rosenfeld. So and you know, initially, students and ch children had come to her house, but then this the structure was built um, all of wood, um, so that it's sometimes referred to as the matchbox school. Also, um, and it was a very project oriented, project based kind of approach to education. Um, and this the story of the Eskimo project often often comes up in the literature. Um, as an example of how things how things were taught, um, and it was very it was really very very much of a progressive school atmosphere. Very, um, you know, very small, very much um, addressed to you know taking one theme and then pulling everything else into it. You know, using it as the basis for learning, for learning math, for learning science, for learning for reading literature, for studying history. Um, and I think I know that my father felt that it had been, it's the kind of education where he really remembered every many, many details of it. Um, it was very different from the prevailing sort of systems of the time in, in Vienna. You know, when he then went to a more public school setting, that it really, they, you know, much more emphasis on sort of memorization, what he referred to as rote learning. Um, and one of the one of the criticisms of the Hitzing School was that it didn't prepare its students for the kind of education that they that some of them ended up having to deal with later. Um, but on the other hand, it it was many of the students really, really loved it. Um, there were some some students that my father interviewed later who were critical of it, um, but many of them said that it that it had been a very special a very special time for them in terms of learning and in terms of their relationships with each other, and it was sort of an it really was um, something that that existed in what's known as Red Vienna, the very progressive um, Vienna that was that was progressive also in the in the realm of education um yeah but some some of those criticisms of progressive education are still with us you know mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I haven't gone to one yeah um, <laughs> um throughout the book you attend to peter's relationship to his writing so deeply and um especially when he is interned first in england and then in canada 
You suggest that he wrote and wrote to feel alive. You also give attention to his struggles with the page, noting his consciousness of how difficult it is to be honest, to find his voice. Um, um, would you say a little more about what writing meant to him during this time in the camps and also perhaps how writing featured in his later life? Well, in reading his internment diary, um, I mean, when he was a little boy, that kind of that kind of interest in writing was already there, and um, and he wrote a lot as a little boy. He wrote, you know, and he wrote things in a in a lot of different forms too. Um, but when I read his internment diary, I realized, you know, it was very clear how strongly that interest had continued, how how strongly that need really not interest, really a need. Um, and I think it was one of the ways in which he found himself, um, you know, sort of formulated himself to himself so that, it, and and he wanted it. One thing that emerges is that he, he wanted it really to be authentic and really to be something genuine. Um, and he was, he was very conscious of, of what might be just sort of a diluted rendering of things and i think i think it was the way that i mean as you say that he felt himself to be alive but also felt that he could be conscious of himself and of what was going around on around him um i also think that in the internment diary what what emerges sometimes every now and then is that is that he's almost taking a sociological approach to his situation. And that I really think, I mean, I can't help but think that that was influenced by what he experienced growing up, you know, with Anna Freud, really. Um, you know, because now he was sort of going around making notes on things, observing how people were reacting to their situation. At one point, he even tried to sort of chart the rise and fall of emotions surrounding different, you know, problems that were coming up. So I think that, and I do think that that was really influenced by, by Anna Freud and, and the whole setting of the school in which, for instance, children were, were periodically asked qu questions about themselves. And those questions were noted down, not in analysis, but just as a school group, you know, how will, what would you do if your parents died? You know, um, you know what? What would you? How would you survive? Things like that that were that were then noted down and really kept in a file on you know that um, sort of charted the development of that kid of that child. You know. Wow. Well, I want to invite people to put questions in the in the um, chat. Um, and while you're doing that, I'll ask one more question, which is a big one, which is, what is your view are the lessons of Anna Freud? Hmm. Well, that is a very big question. <laughs> um, I mean, I think one of them I touched on in the passage that I read, the notion that, you know, that, that, that irrational fears can be illuminated through rational means and, and that that is a freeing, that that's something freeing. Um, I think another, I don't know if I can come up with exact lessons, but I do think that there's a certain analytical and self, well, maybe I should say like a self-reflexive sort of habit of mind that I think that he learned from her and that and that did inform, I think it did inform his writing to some extent. But I also always have to emphasize that he also rebelled against things constantly and questioned them um, and and turned them inside out again and asked if if it was really so. Um, so I think that the lessons he received from her were always being questioned by him really up until his death you know he was always he the one of the final things that he was working on was um sort of an attempt to form a judgment or an appraisal of civilization and its discontents 
So I think he was still trying to ask himself, what did I really, what do I really think about this way of seeing a human being in the end? Like, what is my, what, what do I have to say about it? What, what is my analysis of my analysis? You know? Yeah, the, the, the focus on the interior life while the world is dissolving. Mm -hmm. you, know, um, you know, that, that tension, I think, from my times of listening to your father lecture, um, I remember a sense of, it seemed to leave him with an enormous sense of irony. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So um, while we're waiting for questions, I have many. Uh, um, um, in, let's see. Hina. Iqbal is asking how taking on the project changed the way you come to view your father. Hmm. I definitely think that it, I don't think it, there was something very recognizable about him. Um, my father used to sort of say, you know, in a, in a sort of somewhat self-ironic way, but also genuine, I mean, he he talked about the fact that he could sometimes that the things that people were interested in when they were small had an amazing way of playing themselves out and remaining constant, you know, as they grew older. Um, and he said, I know this is silly, but he would point out one thread like this person like this. And now look at what they became. They became that. And it totally fits together. And he'd laugh as he said it. But he still he's he still said it. Um, I found. I found that he seemed very recognizable to me when he was a little, you know, the version of himself that I seemed to to see um, that when he was a little boy really seemed consistent and recognizable and familiar to me. So, so in a way, it just added more depth to to the person that I had known, you know. But it also definitely made me aware of struggles that he had undergone, um, and and the and vulnerabilities, um, and the kind of things that he had weathered. Yeah, yeah. It seems from the from the pieces of the journal that you recount that there wasn't a lot of moaning and groaning or shaking his fist at the stars he was always kind of um, observing or in some ways criticizing his writing you know mm -hmm. um, worrying about was he was he capturing it correctly was it mm -hmm. naive was he being naive was he being too negative was he was he capturing the real um yeah yeah um the a big piece of it of the um, of his life story is this is this abandonment by his mother, you know, who would turn up and take him on a holiday or something. But um, how how do you understand her decision to to leave Peter? Well, I think that she she herself had been raised in a in a sort of privileged. Um, setting but without i i have a sense that her own sense of family was um was not altogether stable or solid in the way that we would think of it and i also think that she had a tremendous desire to make something of herself you know her mother had 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 aspirations to be an actress um but all, but then you know had had a salon was very charming and um, I think that I think that that Mem wanted wanted to sort of do something more with herself and she she had been influenced by she also had a, a teacher that came to the house um, when she was quite young like an like I think a teenager or an adolescent. Um, who was who became a very notable sort of activist? I think she was influenced by her 
also to really to go out into the world and really make something of herself. Um, and it wasn't, you know, she she lived in a world where it wasn't easy to be to do both things. Um, but I also the thing that's really quite poignant to me is that I think she always thought that she would be able to visit my father and see as much of him as she wanted to. Um, and then what happened was was the war and that became impossible. So I don't think she ever contemplated as as vast a separation as the one that actually happened where they where they literally didn't know where each other was, you know um, over a course of years. So that was that was something that she hadn't anticipated. And then when they could get back together again, she was quite insecure because she was afraid that he wouldn't feel as strongly about her. Now she was older, she was a middle-aged woman. She she wondered what he would think of her. So I think her her own sense of motherhood was fragile was very fragile and in, and interrupted. And um but on the other hand, her journey out was kind of incredible you know she made her way in the ufa berlin film industry yeah amazing yeah yeah and um you recently were in vienna talking about the book um and i'm just wondering if there were you know any experiences there you know as you spent time in the Freud world uh, that, that were sort of, I don't know, you know, brought things home in a different way or, you know, amused you to encounter or, you know, um, yeah. I think being, being in the actual building that my father had his sessions in was quite amazing. Just to physically be there, um, something about just seeing those spaces and, you know, walking around in those rooms um, I mean, the way the museum is set up is not they've con they've very consciously not made facsimiles of what the rooms were like. Um, but the spaces are there and and the museum is created in a way that sort of sort of um, provokes you to sort of imagine what things were like. and that that was a really an amazing experience, you know. Mm -hmm. So Lorraine um, Schratz is, has a question. She's thanking you for this really wonderful book. And Anna Freud is known as the founder of child psychoanalysis. It is um, very interesting to hear the behind the scenes notes. In the end, did you think, did your dad think that she had helped him? Do you think she helped him? Well, on the one hand, I think that she was a source of stability for him. Um, she was, you know, she was an unwavering sort of presence in his life. She wasn't going away. She was, she was predictable. The way things were done had a form to it that he was, that he was shown and that he could then expect, you know. Um, but on the other hand, as a sort of surrogate mother figure, on some other level, it was very frustrating. Um, because he sort of, you know, I mean, psychoanalytically, this would be talked about as transference, but he he couldn't have her, you know, and that was, and he was very aware of that, and he reacted to it. Um, at some point, even in the therapy he has, there's a whole th a theme of um, of prostitution, you know, there's a kind of connecting between his relationship to her, he pays her for her taking care of him. Um, and so there's a frust there's a frustration inherent in that. Um, but I, I do think that she provided that she that she gave him a lot, that she gave him a grounding that he that he wouldn't have had otherwise. But I think one of the things that he continued to question and reacted to was, on the other hand, this feeling that if you if you feel something, it really could mean something else. That there's a um if you love if you love Tinky, it could be it's probably it it really is true that she's a substitute for your mother. It's not that you're in love with Tinky necessarily, it's that it's addressing your loss of your mother, you know. 
um, the fact that feelings were never, were not always what they seemed to be, always inserting that notion that, um, you know, what seems to be one thing could well be another, and that it, and that if you could find out what that other thing was, you'll be better off. I think that that he really chafed against that, um, but also took it in, and so one of the symptoms that he was, you know, one of the ways that his that his disposition was described or psyche psychic condition was one of ambivalence, um, but I think. And you could talk about that in clinical terms, but you could also say that the ambivalence was his thrashing around in that in that kind of setting, you know, his his questioning of it, his chafing against it too, you know. And she also seemed a little bit on the judgmental side regarding his mother. Mm, oh yes, definitely. <laughs> yeah. That was really hidden from him, right? I mean, he was exposed to that, her judgments there. Yeah, yeah. very much so. Gosh, we've that went very swiftly, and we are now at seven o'clock. Um, oh, um, oh gosh, there's another question. Uh, I guess we will have to hold it, but I want to, um, you know, um, thank you so much, Vivian Heller, for this. <laughs> wonderful talk and um and for this beautiful book which is the kind of book that you can just you know it's like dessert wonderful wonderful reading experience and thank everybody for joining us tonight and um there are links to where you can purchase analysis in exile um <clears throat> A recording of tonight's event will be shared later this week via email to all who registered we hope to see you all next month when we welcome author and deaf rights activist, Sarah Novick, as she speaks about her latest book, True Biz. See you all then. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.